seeking optimism in Singapore cases and citizenship. By Dr. Rizwan Abdulaziz from Asian Culture and Society, Michael Ferio, Youth Finance, Economic and Commercials, or ESSEC, Singapore. Our moderator for the third session will be Dr. Ali Muhanif. I would like to see your keenness. Dr. Ali Muhanif, give a warm applause and conduct as the moderator and invite all the speakers for the sessions. Dean or the stage is yours, sir. We also would like to invite Dr. Rizwan Abdulajis, <laughs> my favorite <laughs> part of this team tank, the core teams of the research. We also would like to invite Dr. Muhammad Samshuri bin Johari. Yes. All right. One more time. Give a warm applause, ladies and gentlemen. Let's begin our third session and keep on spirit and full with courage. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Seremony, uh, for inviting us and the stage to lead the discussion on. Um, oh, okay. oh, stage religious that? education, mention of Muslims in Southeast Asia, I think. A topic that has been raised for many reasons just because the increasing trend of radicalization of religions in Asia is, let's see, in, in some particular parts of the uh, countries such as uh, Myanmar, Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines. And the particular reason we have here. Uh, uh, Dr. Rizwana Abdulaziz, uh, he is uh, this fellow's uh, research fellow and uh, lecturer mm -hmm. in Asia Culture Society, Eco Superior Design Economy and Commercials, ASEC, at Singapore. And uh, allow me to introduce her as uh, part of our uh, brilliant speaker we have in this afternoon. That uh, his uh, her interest, recent interest uh, related to Malay society, with focus on Islam, sociology of religion, multiculturalism, and ethnic relations, modernity, traditionalism, and social change in modern Southeast Asia. So uh, she finished uh, her PhD in Flinders University, but she got uh, MA and diploma in Islamic studies in International Islamic. University Malaysia, UIAUM. And uh, we do have here uh, the discussions uh, from uh, Singapore, Muhammad Shamsuri bin Johari. Welcome to our session. Uh, Pak Sham is a research fellow in the US, I think, the Kuan Yu School of Public Policy in US Singapore. Uh, he published many articles, I think, but mostly related to topics such as uh, social capital in relation to health, welfare, education, and uh, state formation is part of the, uh, his, his interests in research and then uh, social identity and relations and so on. So uh, I think... Uh, as you may read from uh, our executive brief, then uh, the problem of first education is actually embedded within the way how state, government, identity, ethnic relations, and religious multiculturalism 
uh, become uh, the main problem of how the modern state interact with the traditional society. Whether or not the intervention of religious education is part of the policy, mostly because of the uh, political and economic reasons, the way how the compromise made by the state elite and religious leaders in nurturing faith in the modern state of Southeast Asia. So uh, we come, uh, uh, Dr. Rizwana, please present uh, your points of uh, research, and then uh, I think uh, we have uh, 10, 15 minutes to present, and then after that we will discuss and uh, follows, and we open up with the questions. Okay, thank you. Give your applause to uh, Dr. Rizwana. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much, Pali, for the kind introduction. Uh, I'm very glad to um, be here and talk to you a little bit about um, the educational strategies that we have in Singapore related uh, directly or indirectly to uh, preventing violent extremism in our country. And um, the two pictures that are on the cover slide, if we can just go back to that, they tell you about, uh, they show two different uh, social contexts. The first one is uh, madrasa. So um, this is not part of the state uh, schooling system. This is a private school like all uh, madrasas are except for the part-time madrasas, they are linked to the government, but uh, all other Islamic institutions are private. So that is uh, for the first half of my uh, study. Uh, so I did a case study of one of the madrasas. And the second picture shows you uh, social studies textbooks uh, that are used in our government uh, schools, which are all secular schools. So I'll be contrasting, more contrasting the two kinds of uh, systems that we have in Singapore. Uh, by way of uh, confronting, or rather, uh, you know, what kind of strategies they have for building peace. And the madrasas are more overtly concerned with uh, preventing violent extremism. So just to give you a little bit of a brief background of Singapore, uh, according to the 2015 figures, um, well, the, ge uh, the geography of course hasn't changed over years. We are a very small nation state and um, the figure may not mean much to you, but you can, if you hop into a car, you can get from one end to Singapore, uh, of one end of Singapore to the other in about 45 minutes. So that's how small we are, and uh, we are very resource poor, and we are an island in the Malay world. So we are uh, surrounded by Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, Federal uh, Brunei, and um, as I'll explain later, this has got uh, geographical and political. The geography has got political consequences, especially, especially now that we face a terrorism threat in Southeast Asia. Um, very small population, 3.9 million residents. If you look at the ethnic and the religious composition of Singapore, uh, you will see that it's a multi-ethnic and a multi-religious uh, country. And this has shaped the politics of Singapore. And as we confront um, violent extremism, the demographics has, uh, have also shaped the strategies in which we have uh, you know, tried to build a, a society of peace in Singapore. Okay, just to give you a brief overview of the kind of uh, terrorism threats we have faced in Singapore, of course everyone knows about uh, September 11 and of course uh, you know, it affected many countries around the world, whether Muslims live in a minority situation or a majority situation. And um, if we look at the Singapore situation in itself, uh, just after 9-11, um, the government was uh, utterly shocked when it found that there was an uh, Islamic terrorist group uh, linked to the Indonesian JI. So in a sense, we had a local branch of terrorism and uh, it totally shocked the government into action, taking action uh, to ensure that you know, they curb the problem and to make sure that the multicultural fabric uh, remains intact and the multi-religious fabric also remains intact. So the fear was really that if we have an extremism problem in Singapore, not only is it a security issue, it's an issue for our understanding of multiculturalism and how we practice it, 
and how uh, religious rela uh, relations will be shaped in the country. Just to give you two examples of the kinds of terrorism threats that we have faced, if you look at the last point, the latest one uh, that we know of publicly is that in August 2018, uh, we had an IT engineer, very young, 33, he was arrested under the Internal Security Act and uh, he was radicalized like many people were arrested uh, and um, his aim was basically to support armed violence in Syria. So this is the context in which uh, we need to understand the terrorism threat in Singapore. Okay, the argument that I have uh, uh, for today is rather simple. I uh, showed you two pictures in the beginning. So if you look at the two different kinds of places, the secular space in which government uh, schools function and the religious space in which the Islamic madrasas function, if you look at it, these two kinds of spaces, uh, you will see that the students are being introduced to different kinds of citizenship content and different kinds of duties that, uh, that follow citizenship in Singapore through the kind of education uh, that they are given in the name of values education. And when I use values education, I also include religious education uh, in, you know, under the term. So uh, I'll be giving you data on uh, the government schools which function in secular space uh, and some data on this place called the Noor Institute which functions in religious space and um, I, will, I will talk less on how the, the two institutions have got the same overall goal of preserving peace in society and focus more on how the differences are you know, when teachers uh, deliver values education to their students. And uh, if you look at the two programs that I'll be giving you some details about, you will see that uh, there are different contents of citizenship and different duties of citizenship that are expected of students that function in these two different spaces. So in a sense, the uh, argument is not just the data that shows the different kinds of uh, duties and contents of citizenship that we have in Singapore, but it's also to make a point that at the end of the day, uh, in fighting terrorism, we have a more differentiated society. The starting point was to make sure that the, the whole fabric of uh, Singapore society doesn't crumble. So, you know, we guard our peace very jealously. But in the implementation of the programs, we find that there's, uh, uh, you know, a differentiation that has crept in, which ironically differentiates our society uh, in perhaps ways that um, the policy makers themselves may not be able to see. Okay, just a little bit of what I mean by citizenship. Um, there are different ways of defining citizenship. One is, of course, uh, a person's legal... Uh, I have 10 more minutes or I finished 10 minutes? I have 10 more minutes. Okay, I have 10 more minutes. No bother, please. I mean, <laughs> just like express <laughs> Okay, just to clarify with her. Yeah, no All right, so um, citizenship, you know, uh, the common definition that I think is... Uh, accepted all over uh, in different nation states is that uh, you belong in an entity called the nation state and you have a legal status. So your legal membership is uh, what is encapsulated in the term citizenship and of course it's accompanied by different kinds of rights and obligations depending on what kind of nation state that you're talking about. Um, and then there is, uh, sociologists now want to talk about the feelings component of uh, citizenship as well and you know the kind of practices that uh, people are expected to, um, to deliver as a member of the, the state. So if you're talking about um, feelings and practices, they, there can be political beliefs and uh, action, there can be moral beliefs and action as well. For example, if you look at the Pledge of Singapore, uh, we believe in a democratic society that's uh, you know, equal uh, for all, uh, irrespective of uh, language or race or religion. So that, in a sense, is an example of not just a political belief, but a moral belief as well. Okay, so I'm just going to uh, look at the government schools and what kind of ed values education they have there first, before I go to Noor Institute. And the uh, uh, three slides that follow will be on the government schools. But just to give you a, a sense of what's happening in government schools in terms of values education, a broad overview first. So um, when we look at the data that you have in the uh, booklet that was given to you, all of us are looking at high school students. So likewise in Singapore, it's looking at students 15 to 17 years old. And if you look at the radicalization data as well, it is this uh, group in 17, 18, 19. 
uh, all the way up to the 30s and so on that are very vulnerable to self-radicalization. So uh, it's very apt that we look at this young uh, range of uh, people and we've, ha we've got a very differentiated system in uh, Singapore in terms of education. I'm looking at these express and normal stream students and um, in these uh, classes you have students who are of different nationalities because uh, Singapore takes in students from uh, you know, uh, people all over the world. So we have uh, people of different nationalities, ethnicities. Um, most of the uh, people in, in our schools would be the Chinese. And then we have the Malays and the Indians. Um, in terms of religion, we have the Buddhists and uh, we have the Christians, the, the Muslims and so on. So it's a very um, diverse uh, society, a, a very good reflection of what is actually on the streets of Singapore. So our government schools educate most of our Singapore students and therefore they reflect the demographics out there very well. And there are different kinds of values education that we have in our schools. And the, the one that I'm focusing on is called social studies. So I'll give you a little bit of information about social studies. It's compulsory for all students. Uh, we're talking about that age range. And uh, at the end of uh, the year, they have to sit for an examination. And uh, the chief aims of social studies is to make sure that our citizens are prepared for the future. Okay? And um, because Singapore is part of the world, we are so small, we have to be interconnected with the rest of the world. Uh, Singapore students are taught how to, be, you know, how, to, how to look at the global arena as the playing field for them. And um, they also need to understand the complexities of the human experience because uh, the world is diverse and it's changing, it's, very, it's changing very fast. So they need to understand the complexities and not be caught up in, you know, in set ways of thinking. So if I can give you some of the data in terms of the social studies text uh, that is used and the kind of uh, data that we can glean in terms of values education. If we can go to the next slide. Okay, the picture on the left gives you uh, one of the pages from the social studies text that um, I was looking at. And uh, one of the typical examples, uh, or one of the key messages in the two years of social studies or three years of social studies that the students have to go through is that they are constantly being bombarded by the idea of harmony. So um, the idea of harmony is a political uh, belief and it's been there since uh, you know, uh, Singapore's independence. It may not have been expressed in terms of harmony, but the ideal of harmony has been always uh, been very important and has been disseminated to Singaporeans over decades, over five decades and more. And so uh, it continues to be taught to young Singaporeans. And um, so they are taught uh, in a very didactic way what harmony means. So we have a particular understanding um, in Singapore that politics um, or rather the world in, in Singapore, there's a belief that politics in Singapore is very controlled and it's very top-down and, and so on. So here's one example of how it is very top-down and how it's very controlled. The definition of harmony is given to the students in the text and um, there's very little, uh, in the textbook at least, there's very, very little room for negotiation. Perhaps in the classroom in itself, when the teacher interacts with the students, there may be some uh, discussions and some room for negotiation and understanding of diversity and acceptance of diversity. But when it comes to the textbook, it's a very straightforward understanding of harmony. Um, it is that you know, people have to agree in terms of the actions and the opinions and the feelings. And um, of course, there will be differences and that's acknowledged. Uh, but they're told that you know, um, in order to have a meaningful society, they have to um, uh, you know, make sure that um, they find ways of strengthening their social relations. And um, you have to sort of like agree with everybody. And if you can't, then at least be responsible in the way you express your differences. And um, so there are different ways of prom uh, promoting harmony, for example, uh, you know, the IRCCs. Okay, this is another page from the textbook. And um, the students here in the government schools are taught social studies as uh, a secular form of uh, education. They are not taught religious education at all. So there's no religious vocabulary. Uh, in contrast, so let's say Noor Institute, which I'll go through in a while. So for example, there is uh, information about religion. You can see the two pages there that I have. Information about Taoism and Sikhism and Islam. 
which are main religions in Singapore, but they're not given a vocabulary about, uh, or, or rather they're not given an Islamic vocabulary or Taoist vocabulary or whatever. It's just information about religion. And religion is uh, treated in a very non-threatening way. So there are descriptions of religion and it's treated in a very harmonious way. So for example, you can't see the layout very well, but all six religions that are treated are, given, um, are, are put into boxes that have got the same size in terms of length and width. So that's how far we go in making sure that you know all our religions are treated equally in terms even of the physical layout. And uh, students, uh, you know, uh, taught that if there's deviance, as in like there's no religious harmony, then it will not be tolerated. So they are given examples of how the law will come upon them. Right. So um, when we do talk about terrorism, we make sure that we don't, or, or rather the curriculum writers make sure that they don't talk about terrorism within the local context too much. They place terrorism in the international context. So in a sense, it's a very uh, idealized Singapore that's created, a, a Singapore that's harmonious, there's no place for uh, violent extremism. Although, like I said to you, we had a GI problem and we continue to have people who are radicalized. So the ideal in Singapore is that, you know, uh, we live in a harmonious society and if there's international terrorism is coming from outside international agencies are looking at it through different ways you know how to curb it and uh, and so on so international terrorism is not linked necessarily to Muslims either it's treated in a very almost like a newspaper kind of reporting style so that is how in the social studies um, uh, textbooks the government uh, students learn about Islamic uh, terrorism the overall emphasis is on peace building. If I can just go to uh, the Noor Institute to give you a contrast of how um, they are taught religious education uh, with a view to curbing terrorism, it's a very different viewpoint. So we have two tracks of citizenship uh, operating in Singapore, one in the government schools and one in the private madrasas. And what I'm going to share with you is not only happening in this particular private madrasa, it's also going out into mosques slowly. So non-school students are also being exposed to the same kind of curricula that I'm giving to you here in terms of data. So for example, uh, they are taught about violent extremism. Um, okay, this is just an overview of what uh, Noor Institute, the students are mostly Singaporeans, they are Muslims, they can be of different ethnic groups. Most of them are Malay, there can be small groups of Indians as well. And um, instead of the social studies text, what we have are three different kinds of lessons covered over three different periods. Um, and so, or rather three different lectures. One of them looks at, uh, you know, how uh, Muslims and non-Muslims can live together peacefully. The other one, uh, how Muslims should function as citizens in a non-Muslim state, i.e. Singapore and how uh, Muslim students can uh, you know, take part in interfaith dialogue. Um, the course that they have, the three lectures, is non-examinable and they have a Q&A component. So this is the overview of what they have. Uh, let's look at the data in a little bit of detail. So when you look at these uh, students, they are exposed to a religious vocabulary. So unlike the students in government schools, here you have social uh, not really social studies, but still it's values education and it's being delivered through religion and being, uh, a religious vocabulary is being uh, utilised. Um, and so it's very different from teaching students harmony because harmony <coughs> is not you know, uh, accompanied by a religious vocabulary, but here you are teaching students how to be Muslims. And so... Uh, one minute. Okay, one minute. Yeah, sure. And uh, yeah, I have two more slides, Ken. Okay. Okay, so um, the concepts that are, they are taught is, uh, they are all concepts that are coming out of extremist discourse globally. So there are extremists out there, uh, uh, you know, telling people that they should join their jihad, ISIS jihad, and they should migrate at that time to Syria, and that they should go to Syria because it's the, the world of Islam, and, uh, and so on. So they, they should make the hijrah. So all of the concepts are taken and the uh, curriculum writer debunks all of these, uh, you know, um, concepts in the class. Okay, so the next slide, um, they are taught how to contextualize Islam to the Singapore context, and uh, they are taught that they live in a secular, multicultural, multi-religious state. So for example, jihad, 
they are told that you know in the Sunni framework, most uh, Southeast Asians are Sunni is uh, Muslims. In the uh, you know Sunni framework, uh, jihad is overtly about fighting people who are non-Muslims. I.e., you try to convert them to the faith, or you make them submit to Islamic rulers. But here they are taught that you know the Hanbali uh, text or the uh, you know. Uh, the Hanafi text is more uh, better in terms of contextualizing jihad to our uh, you know situation. So you cannot fight non-Muslims only in defense. So if I can go to the last slide. Okay. So when they uh, taught trans, uh, they taught their causes again. Transnationalism is being uh, circumscribed. So Muslims in Singapore are supposed to think of themselves as Muslim Singaporeans and not part of the global ummah necessarily. So if they want to think of themselves as part of the global ummah, well then they have to be educated on how to do it properly. So for example, certain concepts are you know, uh, given to the students, uh, Dar, al Dar al Islam. Do students really have to think of uh, going to Syria or going to Jordan or going to Saudi Arabia or Malaysia or Indonesia where there are large groups of Muslims? We don't have to, the students are told, because Singapore is a perfectly uh, you know, friendly space for Muslim, uh, Muslims to live in. So um, that is one of the ways in which we do it. So um, just to conclude, if you look at the two kinds of uh, values education that are being presented to our students, we have a very differentiated uh, kind, if you can go to the last slide, uh, we have a very differentiated kind of citizenship uh, uh, curriculum uh, that's being presented to two different kinds of students in two different kinds of spaces. So um, maybe you can ask more questions about this, but I'll just leave it at the fact that, you know, um, ironically, we are, you know, introducing greater differences, whereas our in intentional uh, aim right at the moment, uh, right from the beginning, was to create a common sense of citizenship. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Yeah, uh, I think I have some notes of the, uh, from the presentation, but, but thank you for your wonderful presentations. Uh, and I uh, submit to uh, Pat Sam to present some points that uh, might be important for uh, notes, uh, conclusions, and observations. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Now, the good news is I've only got one slide to show. <laughs> but in that slide, Got five points. <laughs> so I require Bali to keep tell me time. Okay. No, no worries. No worries. Uh, 10, 15 minutes. Okay. That's very good. Yeah. So the thing is, uh, I was just now when I came here, people thanked me for coming over you know, from far away and spending my time here. I was telling them I'm actually happy to do it. Why? Because this is a subject that's been a passion of mine. For those who don't know me, I started my career actually as a classroom teacher. I spent nearly 20 years in the classroom teaching the level of the students at that age, well, uh, part of the time that I went on for, for higher education. And so uh, values education is something that I'm very interested about because I've had first-hand knowledge. I've been on the ground, so to speak, all right? First thing I, I, first thing I want to say also is that I'm here as a discussant because I, I want to enrich Rizwana's Riz uh, Riz writing, uh, not so much to, to make critiques of, I mean that will be along the way, but more, 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 uh, more of it is, is to enrich uh, what she's writing about. So she started off by talking about the, how values education in the Singapore context is important because of the diversity uh, of our society, which is true. Uh, so, yes, in, society, in Singapore society, yes, we have a dominant Chinese uh, population, but remember the minority group, the Malays, for example, in Singapore is actually made up of a larger group if you look at the region, isn't it? So that's why it's important to create that understanding that harmony as what we have said. Uh, I'll give you an example. I was Last month, I was in a conference on education, and was uh, uh, I, I, I viewed a presentation by a presenter from from one of the states in India, and she was talking about how they have an issue of girls withdrawing from their education system. And then when we asked, she said, "Well, the girls don't feel safe, and when you go to the schools, they don't even even provide a girls' toy that they had a, a wall, but only one side." Three sides, no walls. 
And then I asked a simple thing. Do you have civics education as part of your curriculum? And the answer was no. They said, oh, we had those messages spread throughout our other subjects. But the point is, there is no teaching on the value of humanity, value of the different gender. And that's, what's, and that's what makes values education very important in our curriculum. So that's, that's point number one, values education. Number two, uh, meritocracy in the Singapore context. Now, you've got to look at the history of the Singapore education system. When Singapore was colonized, the British basically allowed each ethnic group to create their own systems. So we had vernacular schools where the subjects are taught in the different languages of the ethnic groups, and the curriculum was also set according to the whims and fancies of the different ethnic groups. So when Singapore received independence, there was this need then to create unity, especially in the education system. And so what the government at that time what did was they created a uniform curriculum. Now, when you have a uniform curriculum that takes away the need for any uh, ethnic group to uh, insist on, on the subjects that they want, that means there's only one standard to recognize abilities of students, exams. And the exams are made the same for everyone. So it got to such a, 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 a time where meritocracy, where ability is based on how you do in your exams becomes paramount importance. And so that's why I agree with all the previous uh, speakers who talked about how values education being a non-examinable subject then lost out in terms of importance because that's what happened even in Singapore. So because of meritocracy, values education became center stage. Even at points where teachers behind their backs of the administrators would actually teach the examinables, examinable subjects during the periods where you're supposed to have values education. So that's what happens in Singapore. Rizwana mentioned about social studies as part of values education in the Singapore curriculum, and that is correct. But this is where my next point comes in. If you can touch my next point. And that's about learning to know versus learning to feel. As what Rizwana, Rizwana correctly says, the values education in Singapore, especially when it comes to subjects like social studies, is examinable. But they teach content for people to know how, what it means to be a good citizen, as what she has written. Okay. What is important, of the value of democracy as a system of government. Those are all good to know. But the only way to create understanding is when you have opportunities where you can bear your heart, where you can bear your soul, so to speak. I was reading Riza's paper and she quoted one of the teachers talking about uh, acting out situations as one of the lessons uh, that they had. This is a good example. Have you heard of forum theater as, 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 as a, a subject? as an activity. Forum theatre is when you have a practitioner, a drama teacher for example, getting people together. She gives out a scenario spontaneously, gets them to act something out and then she stops and then she asks the students what could have gotten wrong or what should have been right in the way they acted. And that's, then that's an occasion where they can really say I'm not happy with the way they responded to how I acted because this and this and this. I felt discriminated, I felt there's prejudice. So this is an opportunity where feelings can actually be uh, 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 highlighted, can come out. Okay? And that doesn't happen in mainstream curriculum. Right? 
many many other ways to do it circle uh, conversations is one if you're familiar with the concept but the idea behind it is to have an occasion where students can really have heartfelt talk in their interactions and it doesn't happen in subjects like social studies i mean i can tell you for sure you know why because i've been appointed as the expert assessor for social studies textbooks okay. and yes i do what i can because I, I look at content, but this to me is really not the best way to surface feelings that creates understanding between students. Okay, so that would be something that can be uh, talked about. What's my next one? Common space. Now, common space, if you would have read uh, is one of a writing, talks about how the government feels the need to create an area where there is commonality among people, among citizens, where outside of that, then it would be uh, areas which make them distinct. In Singapore, we even have physical setups for this. So you have, you know, in public housing at the bottom, you have the void decks, you have where people wait for the lifts, that's a space for them to meet, whether they want to or not. So those are all opportunities to create common space. Thing is, when I was talking to the people at the madrasas, they felt that the madrasas are also places where they create common space. So I was asking them, what do you mean common space? You are all Muslims, you know, studying as Muslims in a madrasa. But they say, the issue here is, while they're in the madrasa, they are taught the same things, but when they go back to their families, the way Islam was understood, the way Islam is practiced by members of the family or in places outside of the institution, could be very different. And that creates differences in understanding. And so that's why, while in mainstream society, the concept of common space is there, but even in the madrasas, the concept of common space is used. Uh, for that matter, let me just add the madrasas. So, I mean, one or two of the administrators that I was talking to say, you know, we want to introduce social studies into our curriculum. So I was telling them why. Because they said it makes us one with the society. It gives the students a place of where they fit into society. That's where. That's what they were saying. And having said that, the madrasas also have their own modules. They said we do have modules which teaches values education, that's not examinable. They call it Firasat Dunia. And uh, they were saying it's holistic, it's interdisciplinary, uh, it's connected to all the other subjects because it is based on a Muslim's everyday life. All right, so my last one, number five, self-censorship. What I'm saying about here is that, like what Grace was saying, the focus when you talk about values education and terrorism is for uh, terrorist activities which happen outside the country, not so much inside the country. So there is this self-censorship and I feel that there is a need to admit, to open up. Okay. So for example, the, uh, the, 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 they, didn't want, they don't want the, the focus to be on Singaporean Muslims, but if they look backwards, they will know that terrorism is also, I mean, in Singapore's history, at least in the 50s, for example, the communists were very active. And the communists were made up of Chinese youth from the Chinese schools. But the thing is, there is this reluctance to take, uh, 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 to, to look at these issues. So basically, the idea is, let's not surface sensitive issues. But I think it comes at a loss. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Asham. Uh, I think uh, some point has been raised by these two speakers, and uh, it's very important to address uh, the way how, uh, assuming if education is the process of civilization of the citizens, then that would be uh, a problematic, and every state will face some kind of dilemma in which uh, you want to, uh, in which discussion, you want to build kind of civic citizens 
enrich uh, unity, harmony, a sense of self-censorship will be, will be raising, or your debate are normal. The dilemma will be there. Uh, in, in, in every education, there is always a story of the way how this religion, every religion is emerging. It means Islam, for example. Every, uh, the story of religion is always a story of building community, right? <coughs> and building nations, building state is always, you know, intersect with the with the kind of uh, dynamic. So, what kind of uh, things that I think the policies, uh, actions, or strategies that secular state, those state that claim themselves as a secular state, uh, you know, combine this kind of dynamic? You're right that uh, you know self censorship, uh, self censorship is very important, but this is a level of uh, the way how traditional community can have a uh, censorship in the sense of uh, having sense of community, national community. Thank you very much uh, at this point, and, and I think uh, we open uh, some uh, questions. Uh, we will see. So the speakers can collect three, and then if we have time, then. We, we ask some number three. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Munji? Okay. Uh, some others? Yes, you should. Okay. Anyone left? So please uh, uh, go forward. Uh, and uh, this is better because uh, there will be a uh, short time process. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ali Hanif, and also both speakers. Uh, I have a question. Um, I was wondering whether the term harmony, or probably social harmony, is understood uh, differently by different group of people in Singapore. Because in Indonesia, the term harmony, or social harmony, can be easily twisted into an effective tool to blame the victim. Um, for instance, uh, you know, within the context of majoritarianism, when something happens, when conflict happens, uh, people say, we love harmony, but you create a trouble. You minority create a trouble. So the trouble comes from you. Tolerance here means that be nice and you will be happy. If you are a minority, you should be nice, otherwise you will not be happy. So I was wondering whether the term harmony in school and outside school in Singapore is actually understood and probably practiced by different group differently, or uh, what is the story? Thank you. Yes, please. Can you move forward here? Thanks. All right. If you have like louder uh, voice, that would be great. <laughs> uh, Jordan Newton from the Australian Indonesia Partnership for Justice. Uh, two quick questions. Um, in the cases, the two cases of radicalisation you had in your first few slides, uh, I was curious to what extent was formal education a factor in the radicalisation, or if it wasn't. Where were the failures in formal education such that they were able to become radicalised? Uh, and the second question, actually probably following on a little bit from the question earlier, um, the talk about values education, um, who determines those values? And the reason why I ask this is because values education is often raised in CBD programs in other countries, particularly in Britain as part of the prevent strategy, to an extent sometimes in my own country. It is problematic. Sometimes, so I'm curious who determines the values in a values education, and what challenges are there to uh, creating a education system based around those values? Thank you. Your name and institution, please. Uh, Jordan Newton from the Australia Indonesia Partnership for Justice. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. You will come, uh, Bali, please. Uh. Thank you very much. My name is Alim from Kalijaga Institute for Justice. Uh, I have some question from your presentation, uh, it seems like the 
extremism uh, case in in Singapore is not as complex as in Indonesia cases. For example, um, when talking about hijrah, it seems like only physically hijrah. But in Indonesia, there are some psychologically hijrah. So for example, in my research, when I get an uh, interview from the Nikobis, Chadaris, they have their uh, new name after hijrah. With what does it mean by hijrah by word? It seems like from hijab to Chadar, to Nikob. So they have their new name. For example, the real name is Nurul. Then after hijrah, they have Sagita, meaning sabar, giat, and taat. So, <laughs> so they have their own name after hijrah. Is Sagita uh, patient and diligent and pious, I think. Yeah. So is there any uh, uh, case like this in Singapore? Because like here, we also discuss about Tawhut, for example. Also, is there any case in Singapore like Tawhut, Hilafa, Hijrah with psychological meaning? Mm. Or as well, is there any law about Nikobis? Because after searching from uh, many countries, because I did research for Nikobis in Egypt and Indonesia, when we talk, when we ask about Hijrah psychologically, the Egyptian Nikobis, they don't understand what does it mean. But here it's very popular. Yeah, for the hijrah with psychological meaning. Uh, so, is there any certain rule or law about Nikob in Singapore? Is it law or is it a ban over there? Because like now there are many countries that getting to ban the Nikob is like uh, what uh, the one that from my interview in Egypt in Parliament now. They are trying to arise the issue of Nikobis by like there, there will be fine for Nikobis who we are in public area or in several uh, social service or public service. So could you please tell us about this kind of issue? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I proceed to the speaker first and then uh, we collect other trees. Thank you. Thank you all for your questions. Uh, maybe I can just start by uh, giving a few comments to Pa Ali's, uh, you know, idea of um, the Ummah and you know building a, a, a cohesive uh, country through the concept of citizenship. Um, the idea of Ummah, you know, it's um, it's actually in a way romanticized. If you look at uh, Riyaz Hassan's study called Faith Lines, he did a study, I think, of different uh, Muslim countries. And uh, he tried to operationalize the concept of Ummah through different markers. And he found that you know, uh, Muslims did not all agree on these markers that he presented to them. I can't remember the markers offhand now. But his conclusion was that you know, the idea of Ummah is not necessarily shared by all the Muslim countries uh, that he surveyed. Although he did find that um, the idea of Ummah is real and it is shared, there is a sense of fraternity, but it is also quite nebulous. So when you try to you know, uh, anchor it down, it may not be as simple as everybody, all Muslims agreeing with each other on whatever issues there may be. There are differences. And uh, also in the Singapore context, uh, just one, one more point. Um, although in my uh, case study, I showed that the idea of Ummah is being circ circumscri circumscribed in uh, that particular new institute, MUIS in itself is uh, very proactive in building an international Ummah. So it invites, let's say, particular kinds of speakers into Singapore to give talks. It engages with different kinds of Muslim communities out there. So it is not so much the idea of Ummah that is um, being circumscribed, but there is a particular idea of what Islam should be in Singapore. It should be very modern, it should support the secular state. So as long as certain of these ideals uh, you know, uh, are there and they are supported, then the idea of Ummah is, doesn't seem to be too problematic. Why they are sort of like you know, going against the discourse of Ummah in the particular madrasa that I look at, is because they are directly responding to extremist discourses. So they are not being very nuanced. But um, I also have to say that I didn't do any participant observation, so I do not know exactly what the teachers say uh, in the classroom. It could be that they give a more nuanced uh, understanding of Umar. 
um, Dr. Manji asked the question about harmony and uh, you know if different uh, sectors or different groups in Singapore understood the term differently harmony is a very political term so uh, the, the idea of harmony will of course be contested harmony as a concept has been devised by government officials it has been uh, defined, it has been disseminated uh, through schools, through other institutions out there, community organisations and so on. And you find that in these institutions, the word harmony turns up regularly with particular understandings and is being replicated in a very um, uniform manner. So there you will not find any contestations. If there are, then they will be private contestations. But you will find that the idea of harmony may be challenged in different ways. So people may not use the term harmony, but they may challenge the, uh, the performance of harmony, let's say in, in, in common space, and they will say they disagree, but they may not say I disagree with harmony. So whatever contestation that comes up is a contestation of the concept of harmony in itself. And definitely not everybody in Singapore is going to uh, you know, buy the idea of harmony. Uh, different social classes have got their own ideas of whether you know certain government policies work for them or, or don't work for them. And so you have different sectors of society responding So, um, if I can go to Mr. Newton's uh, question about whether you know the self-radicalization cases that we've seen so far in Singapore, whether formal education has been a factor uh, in pushing them towards that way or it hasn't been, um, depends on what we mean by formal education here. Um, many of these self-radicalized people have come from the secular education system and not the Islamic system. In fact, as far as we know, uh, in terms of reported cases, there's only been one uh, madrasa student who has been detained by the ISA. All of the other people uh, have come from the secular uh, sector and many of these people are young people, very idealistic, very educated. The example that I showed you just now was of an IT uh, you know, engineer. And uh, when you talk to the people who do radicalization, uh, uh, who deal with that matter, they tell us that you know uh, many of them come from the sciences, the hard sciences, and not so much the social sciences. Uh, having given that broad overview, whenever uh, cases are reported uh, to us in the public, uh, very minimal information is given. So we do not really know exactly what ideologies spurred them, at which point, uh, which factor came in uh, to push them towards radicalization? It can't be just one factor. It must be a set of factors working over a period of time. And uh, it may not even be religion linked. So we don't have the opportunity to talk to them. And there's very little information coming out of uh, you know, uh, public channels. And even when you talk to the people who do research on these areas, um, they cannot reveal information because they are being bound by ISA's uh, conventions and so on. So it's a very grey area, it's an it's a area full of mystery. We don't know exactly you know, who these people are except for their names, their ages, the, the, the last job that they held. Um, and then they are given protection as well because they go through um, education to reintegrate them into society. So they're given a sense of privacy, which I think is very essential. So there's very little information about exactly what goes on uh, in the minds of these people who have been radicalized. And who determines values education? If you're talking about government schools, it's the uh, Ministry of Education. And uh, if you're talking about the madrasas, some madrasas are linked to the government. So they would have, uh, you know, uh, the MUIS, Majlis Ugama Islam Singapura, uh, you know, working out the curricula. And um, these uh, curricular writers from the government-linked organization may bring in private uh, curricular writers into the fold. So there is a, a lot of cooperation between the private and the public sector as far as Islamic con education is concerned. But when it comes to government education, it's very straightforward. It is, uh, you know, people like Sham, he was a school teacher, you know, uh, linked with the government sector. So people like him, it's very clear, it comes from MOE. And uh, sis, uh, Alim, Alim, I think? Halima. Halima. Okay, um, she was asking, yeah, very interesting questions. So um, in Singapore, of course, radicalization is very, uh, you know, complex. And um, we're talking about psychological hijra and so on. I think if we talk to the people who have gone through that process, 
I think we will find similar understandings because radicalism is not a, a plus minus thing. It is a, a process and how they you know, conceptualize, how they reconceptualize, how they look at certain domains of Islamic life. And you know, uh, it can be any number of factors that come into you know, play uh, as they go through the radicalization process. And I was telling, uh, as I was telling Mr. Newton, we really don't know what's going on in the minds of uh, people who have gone through this process. So um, I wish they would open up, you know, th that sector of people uh, for us to go and talk to. But I can't really tell whether, uh, you know, um, there you have psychological history. Or not. I'm sure there is, you know, I'm sure there is because the mind is changing, and how they change it has to do with how they play with concepts and so on. And um, the, the last point about niqab, in uh, public places, you cannot, let's say you go to the bank, you cannot wear the niqab, or if you take your picture for your identity card and so on, you can't wear the niqab. But as far as I know, there are no hard and fast rules which can be used to say that if you do wear it in certain spaces, then you'll be fined. I don't think we have uh, laws like that. But there are, um, you know, strong, uh, strong ways of uh, getting people to be in line because uh, one example I can tell you is that when I went to a Muslim organization giving bursaries to students, um, one of the moms turned up with a niqab and one of the government officers was there as a guest and immediately he asked the organization giving the bursary, uh, you know, what is going on with this lady wearing the niqab. So there are all these informal conversations that are, that are had and sanctions that can come out, not through formal channels, but through informal channels. Because the, the power of authority in Singapore is, is so great that all you have to do is uh, to be in a position of power and to make certain kinds of comments in certain kinds of places, and you will be listened to. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we open other questions, of course. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, just to add on to what this one has said, Singapore is a very small country. And uh, the top down approach is actually very strong. And when she talks about uh, some info not going out, I mean, I am a policy researcher. So it frustrates me because I would have done research and I would like to share information, but I cannot. And so I think for some of us researchers, we, had, we face the same kind of dilemma. So that, that is an, an issue uh, that, that I face. Uh, in terms of uh, how many, that's the thing. I mean, since a lot of it is, is decided by the higher-ups, uh, in terms of the terms, uh, it becomes, uh, again, like I mentioned, learning, how, learning to know and learning to feel. That is very important. So the thing is, if the definition of those words are decided by the people on top, and what you do is just repeating it to the students, after a while, it doesn't work. I remember in my very early years as a teacher, and I was teaching them about harmony, and the response from my students would be, and this is, this is uh, mainstream, uh, not so achieving schools. So they would say, cha, not teacher, huh? cha, this is propaganda. I said, no, I'm just telling you what it means. Said, no, we're not going to listen. This is propaganda. So that's, that's, that's the extent of what happens when everything is decided uh, by the top. And that becomes an issue. Same thing with, with values education. There was a, a bit of a hoo-ha when there was discussion on, on this concept of communitarianism. Because at one point, there was this decision to have something called Singapore's shared values. That's a set of messages where Singapore's, Singaporeans were encouraged to live by. But these shared values, were actually, the argument was that they're an offspring or they're taken out from Confucian values. And Confucian being very Chinese values. So some of it don't fit in well with the values of the other ethnic groups. So uh, that has been an issue uh, with Singapore. While we've prospered and, and, and we've uh, We've uh, remained peaceful and stable, but well, it does come at the price. <coughs> but I'm glad to say that our latest group of leaders are trying to change that. And the word that we get from them is, let's try to have it bottoms up this time round. And that's, the, that's what we're encouraged to do. But uh, we'll see where it goes. All right, thank you.
what happened? <laughs> So we're able to have more time for more questions. How many minutes? Like 15? Yeah, we still have a lot of time. So let's just go back to the floor. Any questions? More further questions for Dr. Samsuri and Dr. Iswana? I'm representing Dr. Ali. Mr. What? Prof? Anyone? Come on, I challenge you. <laughs> more questions, please. Okay. All right, so please kindly raise your hands before Puff what? <laughs> raise his hands. Oh, so another question then. All right, so I give it back to you, yeah, Dr. Ali? Okay, and some other questions? Explorations of what, please? Yes. Uh, other. I think what I said, you have to raise some questions because we know that you are Malaysian, Singaporean, Indonesian, both. So, all of us. Please? He's already been answered. Can you ask questions? Okay. Um, when we are talking about Singaporean kind of Islam, it means we have to look at Islam and Singapore as something open to discuss. Um, now, I'm, I don't know if that is the thing, that if that is what you have in mind when talk about Singaporean Islam. Uh, it is not possible to contextualize Islam in Singapore if Singapore is kept closed. I don't, I don't know if you look at Singapore as something open. Singapore thing is open to discuss, something to look at critically or to change, or something already there, closed, no question asked. But you can ask a lot of things about Islam, but not Singapore. Yeah. Is that the case? I, I don't know if you can ask, answer that question. The second one is, uh, when I was students in 19, 80s, 1984, I think, uh, <laughs> when you were not born yet. <laughs> I'm old already. Colonial generation, but you are not millennial. Um, I have, I think, a lot of Singaporean uh, Muslims come to Indonesia, to Jakarta to study, but not anymore now. I, I'm afraid, I, this is the question to me now to you, to Singapore. Which one do you like to be with, Indonesian or Malaysian? <laughs> Which one do you like to prefer, to follow Malaysian Islam or Indonesian Islam? Because you seem to be afraid of Indonesian Islam. That's my impression. So that's the question I think enough for you to answer. Uh, my name is Tati, probably YN. Uh, Pak Samsu, yeah. Pak Sham, sorry. Uh, was interesting to know that you were a teacher, classroom teacher, you know the challenges when you were in classroom. So I would like to know you, you were a teacher and also a um, Singaporean and Muslim. Uh, what, was, what were the challenges when you were teaching? Because you have some set of expectation that you need to teach a certain principle of what is considered shared values of being a Singaporean. At the same time, you also, you know, facing the doubts by the student that you are spreading the propaganda. But I would like to know from your genuine experiences as a teacher that doing the job, the hardest jobs ever. We are doing research, but they are doing the job in the classroom. So I would like to know from your personal experience. Thank okay. you. I'll, I'll answer that question. Please, you answered the, <laughs> the previous one. <laughs> well, Here's the thing, I mean, uh, it was mentioned for when I asked about checks and balances in the early sessions and one of the answers has to do with teacher training. So it's the same with Singapore. Every teacher in mainstream schools goes through one route. Okay, I mean, uh, after we get our degree, we go to a postgrad diploma in education where we study at the National Institute of Education. So everybody goes through the same route, everybody 
gets the same messages and everybody gets the same curriculum of what to teach in school. So very difficult to deviate from that. Uh, and if you deviate, uh, well, it, it's a matter of how much that deviation is, is because if you get reported, then you do get in trouble. But for me, as a teacher then, I do try to get uh, certain messages in. I mean, for example, this is recorded, okay. Uh, okay, but, so for, for example, when we talk about terrorism, as I mentioned, uh, the focus then would always be on Muslims and how Muslims were a source of terrorist activities. But I would remind my students that terrorism is a term for an action and it did not be directly attributed to one group because it is caused by feelings of dissatisfaction. It is caused by beliefs among groups of people. And because of the strength of that beliefs, the strength of that dissatisfaction, it leads to terrorist activities. So then I would point to them to different groups of people facing the same situation. As I mentioned before, uh, in the 50s in Singapore, we had terrorist activities by communist believers, and they come from a certain group of people. And that's where I try to differentiate and get the students to see that uh, terrorism, yes, but it is, not, it is not because of just one group of people. It happens to other groups. And that's how I try tactfully in my capacity as a teacher then to try to get students to think differently about terrorism. But the problem sometimes with, with Singapore is there is selective memory. See, remember when I was talk, talking to Prof Hatner just now and I was telling him about religious education and then he talked about how he was told that it was taken away because of the fear of extremism. But I told him it wasn't that. During Lee Kuan Yew's time, he took it away because, because of proselytization. It's got nothing to do with extremism. Extremism came many years later after the program was taken out and the idea of reintroducing it was what that created the fear. You see, but people don't remember that. They only think about the latest law, fear of extremism. So that's an issue I have with Singapore's selective memory. You know, perhaps the fear that it looks bad on one group of people so they don't want to bring up, but if you look at the big, bigger picture, uh, it might be better because then it creates a better understanding of the situation. So that was what I did then, not so much now. And just to add on a bit about the selective memory uh, point, um, I think Singapore being so small and we live in you know, uh, a Malay region, where we are just uh, dominated in so many ways, overwhelmed in so many ways by Malaysia and Indonesia, which have got you know, uh, such a glorious past and a long history and such a diverse community. Uh, you know, and they give us wonderful food, so much of diverse food. The, the point is that Indonesia and Malaysia have, uh, to a lesser extent, Brunei, they have overshadowed um, Singapore, even in the study of uh, society, Singapore society. So even in the academic field, uh, when we look at the treatment of Singapore uh, by academics who are outside of the country, um, they tend not to look at the nuances uh, that exist on the ground. So for example, when I did my master's in SOAS, I was quite appalled that in the library all they had was uh, about you know uh, the authoritarian government in Singapore. Um, yes, you know we do have a very strong government, but that's not all we have. We have so much of diversity. We have different political voices. We have different people using different channels, uh, voicing their opinions, and so on. So there's a very stereotyped view of Singapore, different aspects of the society, and academics sometimes I feel fall into that trap as well. Especially if they don't live uh, like Sham and I do in our country and they don't see uh, the unfolding diversities uh, on a daily basis. Um, I'm just trying not to answer part one's question, which is just so sensitive. But let me, okay, let me try, you know, how to, uh, try to see. 
how to answer this question on Indonesian Islam and Malaysian Islam? Well, firstly, there is no Indonesian Islam and Malaysian Islam. There, there are different versions of Indonesian Islam and different versions of Malaysian Islam. And likewise, in Singapore, we have uh, you know many, many uh, groups putting forth their own interpretations of uh, Islam. And uh, sometimes, uh, you know, undergirded by institutional support and power as well. So um, the question of, you know, which Islam uh, do we feel more comfortable with? Uh, I don't know, you have to talk to whoever you want to talk to and they'll give you the answers that they feel is most comfortable to them. So that will reflect the diversity in our society. But just to um, give a few historical uh, pointers, which I'm sure all of you know about, um, we used to have uh, Madrasa al Junior in uh, Singapore, which still exists, and used to be a magnet for uh, you know people from around the region coming into Singapore to study Islam. And uh, decades later, like maybe two decades later, we had uh, Singapore students going to Malaysia and um, to Indonesia to study Islam. Um, but I think all of this was pre-terrorism. And the moment uh, terrorism emerged on the scene, it completely changed the political dynamics uh, you know, related to our neighbours, because our neighbours have got Muslim majority uh, communities. And uh, Singapore, in many ways, is very different from uh, the other ASEAN countries. And um, we are very small, for one. We cannot afford to fail. That's the national narrative. We cannot afford to fail. And um, the other thing is that, uh, you know, secularism is enshrined, uh, not in the Constitution, but in other documents uh, that are related to the Constitution. So, um, in a sense, um, you know, we have tried to ensure that we preach and practice multiculturalism because anything other than that would just uh, split us apart. And we cannot afford to be split apart because we're too tiny. We split and then what happens? Where do we go to? You know, we just have no choice on this matter. And I think that would explain uh, Singapore leaving Malaysia. And uh, so I think that answers your question, you know, what is our attitude towards uh, Malaysian Islam, at least from the official viewpoint. On the ground, we'll have many, many different answers. But if you look at the official viewpoint, uh, the answer is, well, look at our history. Why did we leave Malaysia? And, you know, uh, do we want to walk that line now? So that is how I think uh, you will have many government officials answering that question. And I think Indonesian Islam has always been attractive to Muslims, uh, pre-terrorism. But unfortunately, terrorism and the way we talk about it very holistically, we don't have a very you know, advanced understanding of it. Uh, we don't look at the complexities enough. And so, uh, unfortunately, Indonesia is tarnished uh, you know, by this broad brush of terrorism. And um, there is a fear that we will be overwhelmed by Indonesia. So uh, the effort of uh, post-terrorism has been to ensure that we develop uh, an indigenous understanding of Islam. So uh, you know, that has been effort in the last 15 years and um, so we will, the official line is that we will talk to all Muslim communities and work with them as long as there are certain principles that uh, you know um, allow us to do so and that is one, uh, one is uh, you know we need to respect the idea that Singapore is a secular state, that we are a multicultural state and that we are multi-religious. So as long as it's a modern Islam uh, then officials will feel very comfortable talking to groups or individuals, whether it's in Indonesia, Malaysia, or elsewhere. So I don't think um, they go country by country necessarily, although sometimes I think stereotypically they do. But I think on, uh, on, a, you know, on a more nuanced level, they are looking for a particular kind of ideological Islam that they feel very comfortable with. So for example, we're going to be setting up our own uh, Islamic college because right now our students have to go overseas for their degrees in Islamic uh, learning. So when we set up our own uh, college, uh, in the process, we, many of the officials have been going to Jordan and Turkey and so on because the Middle East is still a powerhouse when it comes to Islam. Uh, you know, the, the idea of Islamic history, the links of the classical texts and so on, they cannot be severe. You need to go back to the Middle East, that's the thinking. So if you then need to go to the Middle East, which countries do you go to? Turkey has uh, experimented with secularism, so that is something that officials uh, try to understand as much as they can. Jordan is a very uh, open face of Islam that is projecting, uh, that is very attractive. So officials go to Jordan to try to understand what kind of Islams uh, are there. 
So I think it is more an ideological understanding of uh, Islam and therefore which partners that they want to um, work with, you see, for what projects. So I think, um, I mean, that's the only way I, I can um, think of answering that question. We still have time, at least uh, five, ten minutes to raise some questions. Okay then. No, no more questions. Okay. Well, very brief questions. Okay. Uh, this one. Okay. No. Uh, very, very, very brief question. Um, you presented the picture of Singapore. Um, you presented the picture of Singapore actually having. Uh, yeah, a lot of control over uh, education, top-down, as how you've described it a few times. I'm wondering uh, how will Singapore deal with the challenge, particularly in those two cases of radicalisation, where self-radicalisation, the internet was a factor. The internet compared to formal education, much more difficult to regulate and control. Um, how does Singapore, or how does Singaporean society go about dealing with the internet and the, the threats of radicalisation online? Well, that's why cyber education is a big thing in Singapore now. And, and of course, you would have heard uh, the issue with fake news, which the region is going uh, about so much now, I mean, not just Singapore. That's, that's one way, I mean, it is understood uh, that the internet, uh, the online highway is an open space. It's very difficult to control. So the only way to do it is through education, through awareness. Uh, so we have in schools uh, values education, a component of values education that has to do with uh, internet awareness. Uh, that's where our students are made to understand uh, what is beneficial, how to avoid the pitfalls of the information highway. Uh, but nevertheless, yes, we do have a lot of keyboard warriors out there just like in, in all the countries in the region. Okay, just to add on um, to what Chang said, we have um, this network called IEYN, Azatizan Youth Network, and that is part of a government initiative. So what we have is a group of uh, young uh, Muslim teachers uh, who, come to, who come together and they are very uh, savvy with the internet, and they uh, you know, post YouTube videos and so on. Uh, trying to attract the youth uh, to follow them. So instead of following you know, terrorist discourse, these people, these young teachers, present a very youthful and very friendly face of Islam. Uh, you know, they talk the lingo of young people, so young people would therefore be their YouTube, YouTube followers. And um, they not only talk about um, terrorism and its uh, concepts, they talk about anything and everything that's got to do with Islam. For example, one of the teachers, uh, I can't remember her name, but if you look at a YouTube video, she talks about personal experiences. So she talks about how when she went overseas, you know, what her daily experiences were like, how she coped with them. So someone watching it is, uh, feels that, you know, it's your neighbor next door talking to you. And you feel very comfortable and you want to follow her. And that is the way in which they attract the young people to follow them and therefore to save them off the terrorist uh, discourse. And on a more formal uh, way, um, you have uh, people like these teachers and other teachers as well contesting terrorism discourse, just like they, you know, I was telling you about Nur Institute. So there's a direct attack of terrorism uh, in its discourses. So there are many, many platforms that are being uh, used in Singapore to, to ensure that you know, uh, social media doesn't play that kind of um, strong role. But I think it's a huge challenge. Okay, thank you very much. Both speakers will give him um, an applause for uh, their presentations. Uh, I think uh, sometime left, but allow me to give you a story to conclude, at least to elaborate uh, a bit further about uh, the way how they present that actually religious communities have, have a vision, have different visions, uh, and state builders state leaders, visionary leaders, have another vision of uh, community. So assuming if the national identity is imagined, then we have to build another 
new kind of imagination in which civilization, the civic community is part of uh, our system of education. So that kind of Ben Anderson's highlight that. Because it is imagined that uh, both sides, society and the state, should compete to build new vision of imagined community. Yeah, thanks. I think it sounds like uh, it's, uh, my my story. I, I give this story. My story took place in Smyrna because you tell many things about the uh, Muslims in uh, Chinese majority. Then I give you uh, Chinese and Muslim majority. The story took place in Smyrna in, 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 in late 60s something. Uh, when uh, not long, not longer after uh, Mas Harto uh, established a bill that Chinese names should be changed with an initial name, right? it was 98, 90, uh, 68, 69, something. And in Smart, at the office of the uh, uh, civic and uh, geographic offices in Smart, uh, people lined up to change their name. Ahlim become a Halim, and then uh, Tan become Adnan, uh, Chao become Khoyer, something like that. But many, many names have been changed from the Chinese name into the Indonesian name, right? Apparently, this uh, guy, very humble, simple, small trader Chinese and small, and tried to apply the, uh, with new name, but he has no imagination. What kind of name I put in my, in my eye? And then he come forward to the office, uh, officer and said, Sir, uh, I don't have a major to, to put in my initial. Uh, what's your name? Ahom. No, Ahom. I mean, <laughs> time, no, Ahom. Uh, so you want to change your name? Yeah. Okay, I give you this name. Uh, the officer put Kasno. Kasno? Is it good? Yeah, is it good? It is very good for you. What does it mean, Kasno? Because you know that the two <laughs> formerly Chinese become Japanese. <laughs> and then the, the, this guy, the, this Chinese uh, humble, uh, simple person uh, just uh, think and then whether well, it is good for me because a name for the Chinese is uh, included for the Feng Shui, right? I mean, it's kind of luck thing that he has to consider. And then uh, all of the people already gone at 2, 2, 2 30 uh, in the afternoon. Then apparently the officers not the really question. Hey, Ahom, come here. Where's your name? Where's your, your name? Uh, okay, 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 I'll put the name. And then he, he put, uh, he write something on, on the paper and then submit to the officer. Uh, seems that it is a surprise and the officer become angry. Because it is a joke. You put this name? Yeah, sir, because uh, uh, it is Kasnovo, right? Yeah. But you put uh, the second name. He puts a Kasnovo Dipon Goro. <laughs> yeah. You insult me because it is a national hero. You, you, don't, you cannot put this name to your name, to your ID. Because your name should be very. Uh, Whatever anger has been uh, expressed, and then why you put this thing? You suggest me to put Kasnawa, right? You have a casino that is a joke. And then to put a girl? Tipox on a girl. It was by the state. So if, if state, uh, <laughs> if our society, traditional state, trust to the state, and then the state impose some level of <coughs> legal, educational, political rule of the game for by the state, then we submit it. Although sometimes we are very, you know, very angry because you enforce me to do something that I don't imagine, including the box of war. <laughs> this is the story of the state. This is the norm of state, and as the state become like a norm now, at least in international arena. That uh, it is the, state, the vision of state, uh, have facilitated by the visionary, uh, visionary leaders such as Lincoln, Yu, Mahathir, or Suharto. Uh, to see some, uh, I think, the 
very important to transform imagined community into civic community in the modern nation state, including in Muslim countries. Here, thank you very much, Ms. Rana. Thank you very much, Basham. Give them applause and very good uh, discussion. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Dr. Ali, Dr. Shawana and Pahasham, please can remain on stage, photographers, please capture the moment before they reach into their seat. Please can you stand in, sir, on the stage, we're going to capture your pictures together. Okay, you want to take picture? going to be payable. <laughs> Alright, give a warm applause one more time, ladies and gentlemen.